Hello, my name is Anthony Barocas with Aiba Communications and Stream for Us. I want to talk about doing remote live production in an age of COVID-19. We are now in an age of remote production. I have used many kits where I go to a location, I bring my gear. You see me right about using uh, Switcher Studio for iPad and I've got my TriCaster kit and we deploy cameras in the room and there's hundreds of people and we produce a show and that's just simply not possible at this point. And the re era of remote production where everybody is at home or maybe they go into a small office where it's just them or whatever, and they come to me remotely. I'm not deploying a camera, I'm using their camera and they are becoming part of my show. There's lots of different ways to do this and all different pieces of software, almost all different pieces of software, offer ways to bring in remote callers. Now, obviously there are uh, solutions such as Zoom and Skype and uh, blue jeans and several others which allow multiple people to come together and have discussions but what they don't do is they're not produced shows for a larger audience now some of these actually have like a panel and an audience and an audience can ask questions and things like that and that is you know actually very useful but there's times when you actually just want to produce a show for a a large audience whether it be on Facebook or YouTube or via a, a private CDN, you want to be able to um, focus on the production aspect and have more control of the production as well. So what I have chosen to use is I'm, I've chosen to use vMix and vMix is the tool of choice for me for this specifically because of the capability of the call-in aspect. Now vMix calls it vMix call but um, it's not really a phone call, it's a remote guest, it's a remote camera um, that people are coming across the internet. So it's not like um, a phone call conference. And unlike um, Skype or other tools, there's not a central repository that everybody is calling into. Each of these callers come into my specific solution my control room, this desk I put together specifically to be a control room, they come into my control room individually, each as a separate source. And that lets me position them, have them in different places, pictures and pictures, three across and things like that, or go to them full screen as if they were individual cameras. Because in reality, they are. You know, each person is speaking to an individual camera that's in front of them. And they have a headset mic or they have a uh, little in-ear earbuds, or they're using a desk mic in front of them. So realistically, it's kind of like everybody has their own mic, everybody has their own camera, and I am producing the show via vMix. Now, what I've got set up here is um, on this laptop over here, I have um, vMix call, or this is where I would assess the stream via a second device if I don't want to have it happen on my main device. These three monitors right here are all connected to this laptop, which is a high, pretty high-end gaming laptop. And uh, under it is a, a cooler to help keep it cool because when you're producing uh, video and you've got a lot of video coming in and out and compression for streaming and things like that and recording uh, It can tend to get a little warm So I want to keep this thing as cool as possible and that way I maximize that it doesn't go into thermal overload It doesn't you know, start uh, bringing down the clock cycles to not overheat and things like that. I want to make sure this thing is happy uh, even if you had a desktop, you want to make sure the desktop has proper cooling, extra fans, it's not buried inside of a case. It can really get rid of the heat that it's generating when it computes. Um, it has a built-in camera, but I've added an additional camera on top. Um, I'll show you a little bit more about that when I do a closer walkthrough. And then over here, I have an Elgato Stream Deck, which <clears throat> gives me a control surface that I can control the show as if I had like a real... Uh, function and I'm not clicking on the keys and I'm not mousing around as much as I really need to. So with that, um, I am going to insert video here of what I've got going on. So 
let's start with the main display. And what I have going on here with the main display is I've got uh, down the bottom various tools, um, obviously mail and internet over here is for pictures. Uh, this I leave up, this is the process manager so I can see what's going on. This down here is a fan control, this little icon down here. Uh, NDI for doing NDI tests, switcher cast, which is how I am actually sending the screen to be recorded. And over here is Firefox, which is on my second display over here. Let's go back to here. And then uh, Stream Deck, vMix, and Speedify. So let's go into vMix here. And that's gonna take a, a moment to launch. And vMix is enabled me to set up different shows and build shows for specific clients so that I can do, I did this past Tuesday, I did a, um, a lunch talk with three people at noon and then at six o'clock I did a book launch. So completely different media sets, completely different call-ins, completely different setups, but each, you know, was built specifically in vMix. Now, vMix is a build-as-you-go type of setup, and there are other solutions that are more pre-built, like a TriCaster. You have an A bus and a B bus, and you have all of that set up. And that's not how vMix or Wirecast or some of these other software-based tools work. However, the TriCaster was not my solution for this type of need, this remote production, because it doesn't have enough remote call-ins that I need. I would need to set up uh, a remote computer for each one and then use NDI to bring each of those feeds in and then somehow work out audio back to each person. So it would be kind of complex managing the audio as well. And vMix has a great solution for that as well. When you launch vMix, it launches into a blank template. There's really not a lot going on here. You've got two blank inputs. You've got a couple blank. I actually, it kept my additional audio buses, but even A and B wouldn't be over here on the right. You get your preview and your program bus. And typically that would even be a little large. It would look more like this, but I have a lot of inputs uh, coming in and this is why <clears throat> Uh, this is up as high as it is. So what I'm going to do is the last show that I did was a book launch and I am going to open that. So up here in the top left, you can see I have a bunch of these shows that I've put together. A couple of them are tests and things like that. But here I've got this book event for a production company called Pixel. So we're going to open that. It's going to load this preset. Now, um, vMix calls them presets, but you can call them projects, you can call them shows, you can call them whatever you want to call them, but they're called presets. Now, now that this has loaded, you can see like I'm talking to the camera here, which is the webcam right on top of the screen here. And you can see my audio coming in right here on the left here where it says me. Now me is only going into bus B and one of the really advantageous features that I found in vMix is, uh, this is this is the high-end one, so I can I think I have eight, six or eight calls. I'm only using four, but four has been proven to be a really good number because even when I do corporate shows, it's usually only one or two, maybe three. So four has been plenty, and that's how I've built this show. Um, let me just use my cursor here and I'll walk around. Uh, here we have Brooke, Tom, and Mike. These are three call-ins. If I right click on this call manager, I have this window that opens up. So this window lets me see my four different callers. It would be larger if there was more. Um, and it's also a chat window so that I can chat. So if I need to say, you know, hello everyone. And it is also the way that the callers can choose to send a message back to me during the show because once we're in the show their mic is part of the show but if they need to say something to me they can quickly say um i need to go to the bathroom or something like that and i know to cut away to something else and or something like that um this window i actually don't keep <laughs> on top of my main interface so i actually slide this off to the right here and i keep it docked over here over on this window, I have, as you can see, a browser window with the client. 
uh, which was uh, Interbang Books, and this is the book launch. So we can look at some of the statistics for this. It's got 6,000 views since Tuesday evening. So that is Wednesday evening, today's Thursday afternoon. So in a day and a half, it's got 6,000 views or 6,000 minutes viewed. And that is pretty good. Estimated reach of 4,700. Um, so we can look at the statistics for this, but it worked out very well. Uh, the call-ins, you know, had some uh, data issues, but not data issues, bandwidth issues. But overall, this worked out very well to reach the audience. Let me close this. And you can see, compared to the other videos that are on this channel, this has got a lot of views, a lot of minutes viewed. And one thing uh, that I do like to look at, you can see right here, the peak live viewers, the audience ramped up over the course of the show. And once we actually began, this is like pre-show right here. And once we actually began the show and everybody was actually talking, the audience built and it stayed all the way through the show here. So that is a key aspect to well-produced content. I always find is the audience stays. And then at the end, we had lots of audience questions. So the audience stayed right until the end and then we closed the show and that was it. Peak live viewers was 156. And that just worked out very, very well for us. In terms of building the show, let's go back to the main display here. I have my four callers. And one of the really, really nice features that vMix has that I've really been able to leverage is right here, you can see I'm sending the video source. I can change what the remote guest sees. I can send them output one, which I have set to be program. So Brooke, Tom, and Mike all got to see program on output one. Uh, David here, David was a remote producer for a production company. And David was looking at output two. Output two was specifically this other multi-view window that I have. So David was able to see what I'm bringing up in preview over here. They were able to see what's on program. He's able to see all of the guests. He's able to see a clock timer. Um, and the three shot down here, I left up. So if I'm on somebody full, you can always see how everybody is lining up within the little boxy windows because these boxy windows are cropped. So you don't want to come back to somebody if they're like way over here or they're reaching for something. So he knows if I'm not cutting to someone in the three shot, why I'm not cutting to them because they're hanging out of, they're not, send it up in the, in the in the box down here and then of course me so he could actually like wave to me and like send me a message and we can communicate that way or i can wave to him because he can see me and then back on the main interface we have obviously me as an input then we have these three recorded questions right here where this black box on the left is automatically populated with the brook who was the author of the book so this, if you click on right here on the setup, the, not that, the box one is Brooke over here, setup, background, no, not the background, I keep doing that every time. Box one is Brooke. So Brooke, when she connects, automatically populates into each of these windows, which is really awesome. The same with this three shot. This three shot I have has the publisher, the author and then a fellow author and all three of them are able to have this conversation across the, uh, the windows here. And then up here, I have four overlays. So I'm able to do an overlay for, hey, let's make this live. So we're gonna to cut to this live and we're gonna put an overlay from the, the publisher. We can put an overlay, which is a call to action. Hey, you can order this book now, uh, an overlay for the production company. And I'm able to bring those up on an as needed basis over any, anything that's playing. I'm able to bring these up. So I've got four basically downstream keys. Now, these three things down here in the lower left, these are the three video clips from the callers and you know, for instance, this, this, this one uh, clip right here, let me open that up. This caller, she shot it vertically, but it actually came in sideways. So I was able to come in here in position and rotate it so that it was vertical and I could zoom in and everything. And then I actually did a little bit of color adjustments to it and a little bit of uh, color correction over here. You can see I uh, pushed it a little bit more towards blue because it was quite warm. So we made it a little more natural looking. So I'm able to do that with all of my inputs 
that are coming in here, you know, increase the contrast on them, make them look more uniform across as opposed to <clears throat> just whatever the camera captured at that moment. Continuing down the list of um, sources, I have lower thirds for each of the guests. And then I have, um, this is the still store that we have that we can go to at any time. We have a, a closing video. <clears throat> this is a, the bug. And then we have uh, the opening video. This is the opening video right here. It's called, uh, it's basically pre-show. So this is a long video clip that led into it, uh, had some music, and then, um, and I bring it up here, you can see this whole thing is 21 minutes long. So we had about 15 minutes of just like lead in, and then uh, a good section where he's introducing the book, the author says something, and then we come back to, and then we go to the live portion. And then obviously this is my clock and um, logo in the corner just so, Everybody can see exactly what time it is, how long we've been running, and things like that. And this show came together very easily, but another key aspect of what I like about vMix for doing this, and especially in an era of, of remote callers, in an era of remote callers, the key is I need to be able to communicate with them. And yes, you can, you can text chat, but if somebody's talking and they're looking at the camera, they're not looking at the text, they're not looking away. So I need to be able to talk to them. And especially pre-show, people who are not used to doing something like this, because it's, it's very new to a lot of people, to be able to communicate just ear to ear, you know, like by voice and understand their inflection and you know, reassure them this is all working, this is all, everything looks good on my end, they sound great, they look great, they're doing a great job being able to have a second audio channel. Now, I don't have an audio mixer on this desk. There's literally, there's no audio mixer here. I have the video inputs are coming in via ethernet. They're coming into the network. The audio from each of those sources is coming with it and the audio going back to them is coming out of vMix. Now, right here on the left-hand side, I've got Tom, Mike, David, and Brooke is up here. You can see that none of those actually go to the master audio output. And here's me, labeled me, uh, this is only in channel B. Now, if you come over here and look at Brooke, Brooke is listening to bus B. Tom is listening to bus B. So I'm talking directly into everybody else's ear. So they can all hear me on this B bus over here, the one that's moving when I talk. The A bus is for everyone else. So when David wanted to talk, he's on the A bus, Mike is on the A bus, Tom is on the A bus, Brooke is on the A bus. They're all talking to each other, but this A bus or any other non-master bus is separate from the master until I push this button. Like if I wanted my voice to go master, I push this. Now my voice is part of the program. And since I don't have my headsets plugged in, I have, you know, I've got good headsets so that I can make sure I can hear any even remote noise, you know, so if somebody's doing dishes at a remote guest and they've got the door closed, but you can still hear it. We can tell them, hey, listen, I can still hear the dishes. I can still hear the dog. I can still hear the kids playing in the other room. You know, you can let them know. And if there's anything they can do about it, like, hey, you know, go tell, you know, your daughter to stop putting away the dishes for the next half hour, then we're able to facilitate that. But I need to be able to really hear it. And so having a good set of headphones to listen to what's going on is key. Also, it also makes sure you've got the best audio if everybody wears headsets. This way, the only thing going into their microphone is their voice. You don't want to have them using the built-in speakers of the laptop because part of that goes into the microphone and then the system tries to cancel it out and it ends up actually canceling part of their voice. So you get this really garbled result. So isolate, use headphones, and that ensures the best quality. Even if it's wireless headphones, little Bluetooth earbud, or you know, put uh, little black earbuds and run them behind your back so they just tuck in and you don't even really see it. Ladies with long hair, that just vanishes. So there's, there's definitely ways around it. You don't have to wear big over-the-ear headsets, but since I'm not on camera and I really wanna make sure I hear it well, I've got good set of headsets. Now, coming back over here, when the show is ready to go, I go over to this A bus and at, on the hour when we go live, I click this bus, and now Brooke, Tom, and Mike are live. They actually become part of the master program audio out. 
If you come down here, here's the pre-show, it's on master. The, <clears throat> the recorded questions, they're all on master. And the other clips, they're all on master. So these things will all play out to the master program even if the host's microphones are muted. And then it also needs to play, because you remember, the, the people calling in are not listening to the master. They are listening, I set each of them to listen to bus B. So I have to make sure that anything that plays back also plays back on B, because that's the one I'm talking to, and they all hear it on B. Me, I would solo A, and so I'm listening just to A. I don't want to hear my own voice because there's a slight delay and it throws me off. So I take this and I'm just going to put me up here. Cut. Uh, so what I would do is I would take B goes to the guests. I listen to A. So I'm listening to everyone else but not myself. And I wanted to make sure that I can hear what's going on too. So you can see like, you know, all these video playbacks go to the guests who are listening to B me who's listening to A, and the master for the audience. So that's how I've got this routing going on. And because these are all video playbacks, the audio is just on 100%. Uh, if you wanted to have vMix switch the audio with the camera, then you could add these buttons up here. And what it would do is when you go just to Tom, then his microphone would go on. And when I go away from Tom, this would automatically turn it off, which is not what I wanted to do. We're having a discussion where anybody can jump in at any time. They've got a very quiet environment. So I just turn them all on manually here and everybody's mic is live 100% of the time. And then I manage what goes live up here with the A bus. So that has enabled me to be able to take in the guests, manage the shots, manage the audio, because managing the audio out to the guests is critical. I need to have good audio, I need to hear everybody, I need to tweak any particular audio because there's an equalizer on each input. I, if somebody's a little bassy, somebody's a little trebly, I can go in and adjust each of their audio. And then the last aspect is managing your data. Now. What I've done on this laptop here is I've added a program right over here on the right. You can see I've added this program called Speedify. And Speedify, what it does is it will take two connections. I have both my office Wi-Fi, which is all I'm hooked up to right now so that I could share the screen. I have my office Wi-Fi and I also have an Ethernet connection with a completely second data source. And for that, I'm using a Wi-Fi hotspot and that is only coming into this laptop. So this laptop is able to lean on the cable internet that's coming into the house and a secondary data source. So if you know the kids are on Zooms and my wife is on a WebEx for work and there's a whole lot going on or somebody's watching TV and they're streaming a show and there's a whole lot of congestion on the cable in the house, this program that I'm producing can all of a sudden lean more heavily onto the Ethernet and the LTE data for making the broadcast continue to go with an un un uninterrupted connection to the Internet. It's using both of those things and it will vary the load depending on upon what it sees and what it needs. Then I take this Speedify, comes into the source here and I'm still needing to manage data going out. So one of the key things I've done, especially it's not just your home, but like with cable internet, it's everyone in your neighborhood as well is all on, you know, there's a switch at the end of the neighborhood and then everybody in the neighborhood shares all the data coming from that switch. And honestly, when they tell you you have 600 megabits down and 30 megabits up, you don't really have that. It's always up to. It depends upon what everyone else in the neighborhood is doing. Because if every single household in the neighborhood tried to pull 600 down, everybody's only going to get 30 down, 40 down. It's always, it's, it's a balance. It's an ebb and flow of all the different houses and all the different demands at particular times. And it's, it's an average across all of them. So that's why I do the bonding. But in order to make sure that I was trying to manage this as best as possible, there's two other aspects that I can do in here. And 
One of those is on each of the callers, there's a return video feed and the return video bandwidth to the guest. So I brought that way down. So they're all getting a low 360 pixel across, 500 kilobits, not even megabits or gigabit, kilobits, 500K, less half of one megabit up. But you have to remember, I'm sending four of those. So even though I've got it dialed down, that's a half, a half, a half, a half. That's two megabits up total. And honestly, for the producer, I actually gave him an 800 kilobit. I actually gave him a little bit higher bandwidth so that, and it was 720p, you know, higher resolution, more bandwidth so he could see the multi-view a little clearer. For the guests, they're just looking at the program. It's not really critical that they see what's going on. Their, their job is to look good and talk to the camera. But I'm managing the bits of all these four callers. And if you've got five or six or seven or eight, if, depending upon all these callers, your upload bandwidth all of a sudden starts to shrink. And then of course I'm managing what else is in the household, what else is in the local loop. I have to like be concerned about that. So my primary focus is my main stream output, which is three and a half megabits a second for a 720p live HD stream. Now, three and a half, that's, you know, on average pretty good. It's not really healthy, but I'm also trying to make sure that I'm not pushing too much, too hard, and it, get, it gets constrained somewhere between me and Facebook because this went to Facebook. I need to make sure that my stream has enough headroom so that it still can fit through whatever else is going on in the house, in the neighborhood, via cellular, via cable modem. There's a lot to be concerned with. So my goal was to do a high quality stream at 720p and limit it to that, not try to push 1080 P60 at 10 megabits and then have some sort of herky jerkiness or drop frames because it's trying to push too much and there's not enough bandwidth all the way out to Facebook. Because even Facebook is, is having issues getting things turned around, having video streams be reliable. So just being aware of that and trying to make it comfortable all the way through will do, will do you a lot better than trying to put the biggest, baddest signal out there and then having other issues down the line. Another thing you can do is the incoming stream on this, you can go to advanced settings, remote guest video bandwidth. I have all of these set to auto. Now the auto, I can, you know, set them to a particular bandwidth and it will try to do that. But when I leave it to auto, one of the key features of vMix is it'll dynamically ramp. If somebody's bandwidth goes down, it'll reduce the resolution, it'll reduce the bit rate. And then when it can, when it sees, it'll push it back up. And I've seen through my remote caller uh, statistics over here, these bottom boxes will change dynamically through the whole show. These boxes right here will tell me, oh, this one's at 720p, this one's at 720p, but this one over here, it's been downsampled to 480 and it's just trying to get through. And then very often when there are issues and you hear it having issues in the, in the audio, you look over there and very often it might be um, normal is green when you get everything great and then it'll go to yellow and then red means it just, it's having, you know, it, it might have even dropped to zero for a moment and then it has to come back up. The very nice thing is I have had signals drop out for more than a second and then come back. It recovers very nicely. So you don't have to, don't freak out when it does a little herky jerky when it when there when it even stops for a moment because this the the system the codecs behind the scene that are coming into my you know production here are very reliable and they have been able to recover and just start back up and then a minute later it's back up to 720p coming into me and it looks and sounds great and I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to like manually try to, you know, hey, quick, hang up and try another call. Let's see if we can get a different routing, a different connection between you and me. So these, this over here, I leave this up. So this is always available as a resource to me as to what the current status is. And of course, like I said, this is also the chat window. So if I hear like a little bling in my ear, I'm able to come over here and see, you know, the producer may have said, hey, you know, get ready with the closing graphic. I wanna close it, you know, as soon as he gets done, something like that. 
So we're able to communicate that way. We're able to communicate via Facebook Messenger since we're already in Facebook. That was our CDN, our delivery method of choice. And all of that operates over the two um, internet connections I had. And I could have more than two if I wanted to. I could have like a USB-C connection to another hotspot and have three connections up here and then bond across all three of them. And this interface allows me to manage everything that's going on in the show but honestly, vMix until this year has, is new to me. I come from a broadcast background. I like having a control surface. Here's my input row, here's my output row, and then I you know, build everything else. I, it's kind of regimented to coming from that end. And vMix is sort of like craft it however you want. It's sort of like baking your own show. How much of each ingredient you put in, it's completely up to you. One thing that makes it extremely manageable is having an external control surface like this. And this Stream Deck couples with, you know, so many different things. Stream Deck uh, is, this is the very, this is the smaller, well, this is not the smallest one. They get this really teeny one. This is about the smallest one that I would like to get. Uh, it goes for about $150. And was it three, one, two, three, four, five, 15, 15 buttons. And this is set up for this show. And let me quick show you that. It's so here is my Stream Deck. Let me collapse this and this and this. So here's my Stream Deck right here. I have it set up for the Pixel Book Launch. So here you can see I've got all three of the hosts. I have a three shot, a three shot plus graphics. Actually, you know what I could do? I bring this over here. All right, so what I have here is I have the Stream Deck and over here on the left-hand side of the screen, we have the Multi-View. So you can see that as I push each of these buttons, the input changes in, into the preview. You can see even see on the second row down, down here, it highlights a different thing. And then the name, you know, you can't really see it up here because it just says preview, but each of these is my sources. Uh, if I want the three shot clean, I click on three shot clean, it pops up in the preview. And then once I get it in the preview, I can go either fade or take. So if I hit take, it takes it instantly. If I hit fade, it fades between them. The fade and take is really handy when I've got the three shot. So bring the three shot up and now the three shot plus graphics. So I've got lower thirds on all three of those things and I fade the graphics in and I fade the graphics out. And of course, like I said, I can go on a, there's multiple screens here. I can go to a second screen and I've got the bug on the right. I've got the bug on the left. So I can bring each of the bugs up uh, individually. Let's go back up. And then I've got my questions. So I can queue up the first question. So he's at the ready and then I can take him. I can go to this question and take that. I can go to the third question and take that. So you can queue up anything you want here. Also, if I go to Brooke full screen and I take Brooke, Brooke's title is right there. Or if it's Tom, Tom's title, or if it's Mike, here's Mike's title. So each of these, you know, because we're gonna be highlighting each of these three people throughout the show, and I'm gonna keep tagging them, gonna keep tagging them, gonna keep tagging them, and then jump over here, put the bug on the left, put the bug on the right, go back up. And this is how I've set it up. The Stream Deck software is extremely customizable. You can build any button you want. You could say, have it say anything you want. And let's jump and let me show you the control panel and how that ties into vMix. vMix is incredibly customizable. I am only scratching the surface at some of the deep, deep capability. There are hundreds of individual little callable commands and there's a whole API set where you can call into vMix and control it remotely that I haven't even begun to touch. So this is just a very light, usage of vMix as opposed to a very deep usage. So let's, let me show you how I integrated the Stream Deck and vMix. So over here on the right, we're going to do the Stream Deck and let me go get my shortcuts. So what I did here was I was able to take these, each button is completely customized. So like this button over here is nothing. But what I did was I created a hotkey. So I take this hotkey, you drop it on a button, 
and then that will let me do what it does. So let me delete this, just to leave it blank. Click on Brook. So I, I, you can call it whatever you want, B-R-O-O-K. You can do caps lowercase. You can change the font. Uh, you can put it bottom, medium, top. You can make change the size, bold, underline, change the color. And over here, you can go get a different background. It's just amazing what you can do. If you wanted to, you can. there's even APIs so that you can have the video from that particular input <laughs> appear on this button. Because on the buttons, these are actually little TV screens in, in, um, in the device. You know, it, these are like, as I make the changes here, they change over on the device itself. And it is very, very amazing. So anyway, now I have the hotkey as numpad one because it's just, I just started one, two, three, you know, it's like, so you go to here, this is numpad two, this is numpad three. And then that's how those are talking to the computer. Then in the computer, numpad one, open preview, put in the preview input, Number one. So let's look at that. We're going to edit this. We want to say num number pad one, and you can pick any button on on the laptop. Then what do you want to do? Preview input. Well, there's a lot of capability here. You can you know if you want to do an overlay, which is how I did the the bugs and the lower thirds. Those are all overlays. You could do titles, output, transitions. It just it is so deep. So input, what I did was I just said, I'm going to preview the input. There's, and just look at all the other commands in here that I'm not using. It is just astounding the capability that's in here. So I'm putting it in preview. And then, oops, let me click on that, preview input. And then what do I want to go there? Oh, I want Brook to go in there. And you can pick from any of your inputs. And that's how it goes. And then down here, you can call this a local shortcut, which will be saved just in this show, or this preset can be part of the application and it carries from show to show to show. So you can actually build, you know, if you're used to a, a more st uh, static type of setup, you could actually build, you know, one, two, three, four, five is input one, two, three, four, five. And it's always going to be whether you have a hardware interface or like that, you know, one, two, three, four, five. And then it, you know, it's my buttons are function key one, two, three, four, five. And my previews are one, two, three, four, five, like a TriCaster. So if you're coming from a TriCaster, you could actually probably get a preset just loaded in and then it kind of operates like a TriCaster because all the buttons are going to be all that you're used to. Or if not, you can just easily build it yourself. That's part of the customizability of this application is that it's not really forcing you into any particular paradigm. You build it how you want to build it. So over here, oop, let's see, that's that and showing the web controller. So we click over here, we say, okay. And that's what that input is. So you can see space is fade, enter is cut, which I bring over from using my TriCaster. If I'm using the physical keyboard, I can actually use that. And then I just come down here and all of these little, all the different pieces of the show, here's my overlay input. So here is uh, her title, here is her title, here is his title, here is bug one, bug two, and then preview inputs for the still store for this title, for the pre-show without text and the lower third rectangle. You know, it's like, this is how I did it. And then obviously I ran out of the num number pad and then I started using F23, F22, F21, F20. And you could use all the keys because VMix doesn't come preset with the keys on the keyboard doing anything. You know, if you call up a title, you can use them as a keyboard. But when the vMix application is actually running, the, these keys don't do anything unless you tell vMix that you want them to be doing a particular thing. That's how uh, this thing comes. Just like when you open it, there's no video inputs unless you load a preset. It's, it's all you build it. But then, that seems to be a downside to some people, but then you build something once and then you can take what you've built and duplicate it and take pieces of it and build something else and build something else and build something else. And then next thing you know, you have you know a half dozen pre-built things and that can cover so many types of productions. And then if you're doing something that's very specialized, yes, of course, you can then take that and mold it into something completely different and save that. You know, one doesn't mean you're limited to that. 
you could do something for else from scratch. You know, you, the, 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 the possibilities are pretty much endless here. But this let me quickly come over here and say, you know, book Tom Mike, you know, three shot, three shot. So what I did here with this one, this is numpad four and this is F24. You go over here to F24, this is preview input. So the three shot plus and the three shot. Now, originally I had the three shot and then I had the three shot with the graphics as an overlay. But then that got confusing during one of our rehearsals where I would then switch to a camera and say, take, forgetting that I was looking at an overlay. So everything I was doing was happening underneath the full screen overlay. And I decided that's not a good way to work. If I want to have an overlay, I want to have like a graphic where I could still see something behind it. So I took that full screen graphic with the three titles and I made that like a regular piece of video. So it would have to go in the preview, be brought over, brought back, and it was not an overlay anymore. So you can change anything that, that is going on in your shortcut list. And then of course, there's MIDI, there's Surface, there's Shuttle Pro, joysticks. So if you have pan, tilt, zoom controllers, you can have somebody switch between cameras and move the cameras around. I mean, it's just so much capability and so deep. This, this application enabled me to do something that if I were to try to do it with my TriCaster, it doesn't have the Skype TX inputs. So I would literally need a separate computer with Skype for each caller. So that's four more computers. And then I would have to run NDI on each of those four computers, have that NDI come into my TriCaster, and then I'd have to manage the audio buses so that each of them came in on one channel and, well, now I need to send each of them a signal back, but minus themselves so they're not being confused by their own audio. That is something we call mix minus. It's the main mix minus themselves. vMix does that, which is another great simplification for the person building. We know what needs to be done. Normally, we have to do it. We have to build it and make it happen. And here, vMix sort of says, oh, well, you're sending audio back to caller one. Well, we're just going to take the audio from caller one out of that. They're not going to hear that. They're going to hear everything but that. So that is a great built-in feature that for remote production, like we're doing with multiple people and multiple destinations all coming in remotely, we're not getting together right now, this type of remote production, and it doesn't have to be same city, same town, same state, same country, same nation, you know, it could be anywhere around the world. They all just come in, they appear as sources like cameras, I'm able to cut between them as if I had brought cameras or I had sent cameras out to all of them anywhere in the world, wherever they're at. This has been a look at my command center for the show that I produced for a book launch and how I was able to leverage vMix with a remote production that looks as good as if I was doing it with everyone in the room. My name is Anthony Barocas from IEBA Communications. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.